So good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Clinical Trials and Transplantation in Sickle Cell Disease webinar. Uh, my name is Delaney Hines, and my pronouns are he, him. I serve as both a member of the Board of Directors and Chair of the Education Committee at SCOGO, and I have the luxury of moderating today's session. Um, in celebration of International Clinical Trials Day, celebrated on May 20th, we have a comprehensive session planned for you today. Uh, if you or members of your network would like to refer back to the information shared in this session, a recording of today's session will be posted on our website, uh, sicklecellanemia.ca, for viewing at your convenience. Um, so, you know, as many of you know, one of our missions at SCOGO is to serve as a conduit for members of the sickle cell disease community to access evidence-based, up-to-date information like we have prepared for you this morning. Uh, today's session is important as we have the privilege of hearing from both the clinician and patient perspectives on bone marrow transplants. So we hope to guide you through an in-depth review of the current landscape in clinical trials and transplantation in sickle cell disease. So in this session, uh, we will be hearing from five of our guests. Uh, one of them is joining us shortly, who I'll introduce. Um, our agenda today will start with one, a land acknowledgement and some additional housekeeping rules, which will then be followed by presentations from our guest panelists. And as well, we'll have a bit of time uh, available to all of you to provide you with an option to uh, submit any questions and have any type of chat or comments you'd like to make. Um, with that being said, we do ask that you save your questions, or if you choose, for the that later portion of the session, but also the questions can be submitted by way of the Q&A function and I'll have an access to them, or you could enter them via the chat. And at that point, we'll have our questions answered by our guests individually. A bit of housekeeping, you know, we kindly ask that you, you know, respect the learning that's being done in this space by abiding by a follow rules. Your microphones, as you know, have been disabled uh, for the duration of the webinar. If you'd like to ask a question, you have the ability to raise your hand, or you can also submit a question by way of the chat or Q&A function. Um, we always ask you to use respectful language, you know, that goes without saying, so no profanity or inappropriate images or posts, please. And please do not post any other material unrelated to today's discussion at hand. Um, and if anything, please do keep discussions and comments on topic as much as possible. Uh, Scoggo does reserve the right to pause the session if we do find that there's any type of disruption occurring, but we really do appreciate your understanding and agreement to, you know, positive participation throughout today's session. A further disclaimer, I just want you all to remember that the information shared today does not constitute medical advice and is shared with you for information purposes only. Uh, no materials shared with you today are intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking any new healthcare regimen. So please do not disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking it because of something that might have been said to you during today's webinar. Uh, so without further ado, good morning speakers. Good morning, Dr. Wall. Good morning, Kay. Good morning, Dr. Richards, Dr. Cole, Gabriel. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing you all. So first, before getting into that, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't provide a land acknowledgement for all the folks attending. So the land in which I am currently on is the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Anishinaabe Mississauga, adjacent to the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation, and in the territory covered by the Williams Treaty. So I personally locate myself on this land of the treaty people. My parents arrived on this land as immigrants to a settler state and many Black peoples before me who've come and gone, who've arrived on Turtle Island through various processes came as stolen people. So today to have, the, I personally am very grateful to have the opportunity to work and live freely on these lands. I'm reminded of our, all of our responsibility to continue the work that needs to be done to undo harms of settler state colonialism and to ensure that peoples, particularly those indigenous to these lands are granted the privileges, opportunities and freedoms that are rightfully theirs. So in today's conversation, we hope to provide a safe space for folks accessing sickle disease, sickle disease care to feel heard and connected with other members of the community. So without further ado, first we are joined by Dr. Kevin Kuo, uh, Dr. Koi is an adult hematologist and clinician investigator in the Red Blood Cell Disorders Program at Toronto General Hospital, uh, UHN, and assistant professor in the Division of Hematology at U of T, and assistant professor in status only at the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at University of Toronto. His clinical focus is on rare congenital hemolytic anemias, and his research focuses on novel therapies in hemoglobinopathies and rare anemias. The impact of sickle cell disease on neurocognition and non-chelating methods to treat and prevent iron overload. Welcome, Dr. Kuo. 
Next, we're joined by Gabriel Dejo, uh, providing us with the patient, uh, patient uh, experience. Gabriel is a Toronto-based Afro-Canadian producer, director, and sickle cell anemia activist. From a very young age, Gabriel had a passion for storytelling and filmmaking. After graduating from the Toronto Film School, he landed a production assistant role on The Next Star and started climbing the production ladder. Gabriel has worked with major brands such as Google, Converse, Land Rover, and the award-nominated CBC Gem series, The 410. He has also worked with artists such as Billie Eilish, Jesse Reyes, and PopCon, to name a few. Pushing for change, Gabriel is an Ontario Health Sickle Cell QSAC member dedicated to creating better lives for people living with sickle cell. Welcome, Gabriel. Next, we have Dr. Donna Wall. Dr. Donna Wall joined the Hospital for Sick Kids and University of Toronto, where in the fall of 2016, sorry, she joins us from the Hospital for Sick Children and University of Toronto, where in the fall of 2016, she served as a section head of the Blood and Marrow Transplant slash Cellular Therapy Program. After completing pediatric and pediatric hematology and oncology training in New York and Boston, she went on to establish bone and marrow transplant and public core banks in St. Louis and San Antonio. Most recently, she has led the Manitoba Blood and Marrow Transplant Program, including the Manitoba Center for Advanced Cell and Tissue Therapy. Welcome, Dr. Wall. Not, we're still, you know, continuing on with the introductions. We join us, we have Kay Bombo. Ms. Bombo is a mother of a sickle cell warrior. Kay has been intimately connected to the bone marrow transplant trial, both as a mother and a caregiver. Uh, she joins us today to share her experience and provide insight on what parents of sickle cell warriors can expect as their children navigate this therapeutic intervention. Welcome, Kay. And rounding out our, our lovely speakers this morning, we have Dr. Don Richards. Dr. Richards is the founder of 502 Labs Incorporated and director of patient and public engagement at Clinical Trials Ontario. With a doctorate in analytical chemistry from the University of Alberta and experience in a variety of roles during the past 20 years, it is her diagnosis with rheumatoid arthritis 15 years ago that started her journey to combine her passion for science with making the most of her diagnosis. In her role at Clinical Trials Ontario, Don is charged with executing on CTO's strategic pillar of patient and public engagement. As a patient, Don is vice president of the Canadian Arthritis Patient Alliance, a research ambassador for the Institute of Musculoskeletal Health and Arthritis of the CIHR, Canadian Institute for Health Research, and was a member of the British Medical Journal's Patient Advisory Panel and the first patient advisor of the Canadian Medical Association's Wait Time Alliance. She advocates for disease awareness, access to treatment and research options, and including patients as partners on research teams and in decision making. So, we are joined today by an esteemed, uh, esteemed panel. I thank you all for providing your time and being here with us graciously. So without further ado, I'm gonna kick it off to the, you know, the meat of today's session uh, by asking our first panelist, uh, Dr. Kuo, if he can kick things off and introduce us to uh, his presentation on, if you just give me a second to remember what it's on, novel therapies and attacking sickle disease on all fronts. Over to you, Dr. Kuo. Uh, uh, thank you, Delaney, for that very generous introduction. Allow me to project my slides now. Um, just want to get a thumbs up if you can see the slides. Yes, you are great. Okay. Thank you very much. So today I'm going to talk about attacking sickle cell disease on all fronts. And as you can see from the agenda, I actually initially didn't have a topic. I mean, I know that I'll be talking about novel therapies, but I'm just wondering, like, how can I sort of vividly describe or, or accurately describe what we are trying to do right now. And, and I believe that what I've entitled it right now encapsulates what we are all trying to do. We're trying to attack sickle cell disease from all fronts. And I'll show you how we're doing that. These are my conflict of interest disclosures. If we look at the current therapies for sickle cell disease, uh, when I say therapies, I don't mean uh, oxygen or, or, you know, or blood or, or um, uh, opiates, uh, morphines or painkillers. I don't mean any of those. I mean disease modifying therapies, therapies that probably can change the outcome of someone with sickle cell disease. We're looking at a very few therapies. There's hydroxyurea that is uh, approved across the board, as you can see, is approved by the FDA, the European Medical uh, Agency, and by Health Canada. But if you look at the other three new therapies that are currently approved by the FDA, the L-glutamine, Voxelator, as well as Crizolizumab, 
um, they're not approved outside of the FDA jurisdiction, outside of the US. And, and I'll show you why in the next slide. So let's start with the L-glutamine. We don't exactly know what mechanism a glutamine improves a pain with people with sickle cell disease. There was a phase three clinical trial with 230 patients. And what they reported in the study was that there was fewer pain crises compared to a placebo. Instead of four crises, uh, people were having three crises a year. And you can see that uh, is significant, statistically significant. And they also found that there were less hospitalizations in those who are taking in diary compared to those who are on placebo, two hospitalization versus three hospitalizations. So that sounds pretty good. Um, unfortunately, though, is that 36% of the people on Endari and, and a good number of people on placebo, 24%, dropped out of the study and it's mainly due, due to GI side effects. So you can imagine that whoever is taking this drug, one, you can have one out of three chances of, of stopping it prematurely. And what happened was that the way that the, uh, the, the company and, and, and the study uh, the way they looked at the data was that for people who dropped out, they were trying to impute to um, guess how many crises they would have had if they had continued on the study. And, and the way they imputed it was to take the number of crises from those who actually completed the trial. And then the FDA was saying, well, that's not fair. And this is what bias means. You know, it's not fair because if you had dropped out of the study, it means that you couldn't tolerate the drug. So how can you have the same number of crises as those who completed the study? So they repeated the analysis and they shown that the, the power or, or the, the efficacy of the drug is actually much smaller than what initially was reported. And this was actually the reason why the European Medical Agency refused to authorize um, L-glutamine to be sold in Europe. So currently, L-glutamine is only approved in, um, in, in US and is not approved in any of the jurisdictions. Uh, next is Voxelitol, well, which many of you have heard. This is an interesting drug. This, this drug actually binds to the hemoglobin and it actually opens it up such that it accepts more oxygen. So that sounds good, right? Because you can imagine that um, the reason why sickle cell sickle is because of the lack of oxygen. When, when the red blood cells go through narrow, narrow places like the capillaries or the, the venules and, and, and the little blood vessels, because it was so small and, and because so much oxygen has been taken out of them already in these area, that they are very prone to sickling. And this is how a sickle cell crisis occurs is, is when there is a prolonged lack of oxygen inside the red blood cells. And so the idea here is that if you can open up the hemoglobin and get it to bind onto oxygen more tightly, then perhaps we can then prevent the sickling from occurring. Unfortunately though, is that while you can see that on the bottom right-hand graph here that um, Voxelator really changes how it binds oxygen and, and how it does biochemically in, in, the, in the test tube. Um, it really didn't show that it was able to reduce the number of pain crises. And so again, it's approved in the US, but it's not approved anywhere else in, in, uh, in the world yet. Lastly, with crizolizumab, this is a, a drug where uh, there was a phase three study uh, that was done in 198 uh, with 198 participants. Uh, it was done in uh, 2017. And what they have shown was that they were able to reduce, again, the number of crises from around three to around one and a half. So, so almost, you know, you have half the number of crises. And also they found that the time to the next crisis was significantly longer, you know, two months versus four months. So, so that sounds good. Um, the problem though, is that because initially when they made the drug, they made it in these cells called Chinese hamster ovary cells. Um, and, and with this sort of production technique, they can only very, make very few batches. In fact, they just had enough drug to complete the 198 patients and no more than that. So because of the, the inefficiency in making a drug, um, the company that bought this drug uh, called uh, Novartis has to remake the drug in another, uh, in a different way. 
And because of that, the FDA is saying, well, you know what, since you're making it in a, in a different uh, environment, we need you to retest uh, everything. So, so now they're, they're, they're rerunning the phase three studies. They're, they're testing a higher dose. But of, of the three that I mentioned, personally, I think this is the most promising because the effects that we are seeing really in, in terms of reducing pain crises is truly the most significant compared to the other two. Nonetheless, you can see that as, aside from hydroxyurea, which has a very long track record, um, you know, uh, whether it's good or bad, um, there's, there's very few other therapies that are available. So, and then you can imagine, well, you know what, if you have only two therapies, why, why, why don't we just be satisfied with it? Well, compared to, um, let's say, high blood pressure, high blood pressure has 25, 25 medications, at least. This is like just off the, off the top of my head, I was counting. And sickle cell disease only has one, maybe two. You see the discrepancy there? This is why we need to level the playing field because you can imagine that even though that these drugs work for some people, it's not gonna work for everybody. And so this is why we need options. And so let's, let's look at the options from a mechanistic point of view. What I have laid in the background here is how a sickle cell sickles and then breaks down. So, so here's at the top is a sickle cell. It actually will sickle right here. If you guys, can you guys see the cursor that I'm, uh, there we go. Maybe I'll uh, do a little laser pointy here. You can see how it sickles and then it breaks down and it breaks down sometimes, you know, macrophages can eat it up, but most of the time it actually causes bad things called free heme, which then cre creates these things called reactive oxygen species. Essentially they're like hydrogen peroxide, very dangerous things, like stuff that you perm your hair with, but it's actually floating in your blood and it causes lots of da damages. It can also cause the sickle cell to, to stick onto the blood vessel wall so that it doesn't move. This is how vaso occlusion occurs. So the idea here is that if we can target parts of these uh, um, uh, areas in, in these mechanisms, then perhaps we can do something about it. Now, if, if you look at sort of the overall, these are drugs that we talked about just now. Next is arginine. We're not doing any studies in arginine. Uh, is in uh, US, it's a phase three study. Those that are in phase two right now, there's a number of them, including Mementine, VIT2763, Rio Cigarette, Imara. There's also a number that has, a number of them in, in red that has completed uh, the phase one study. So, so just to reiterate, phase one is the first phase in when, 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 you're, when you're testing in humans. So before that is called preclinical -pre studies. These are usually done in mice or baboons or rabbits or whichever you want. Um, and in phase one study, they first tested in healthy volunteers. That's called phase 1A. And in phase 1B is when you actually test it in, in people with the disease. Now, with phase 1B, um, we are all looking at safety. They give, they start from very low doses and then they sort of inch up slowly into doses. So that's called phase one, just looking at safety, whether it's safe or not. We don't really care whether it is working or not. If, if it works, great. If it doesn't work, well, we're still going to move on to phase two because we just want to show it's safe. Once we've shown that it's safe, then we move on to phase two. Phase two is sort of a mix. You're, you're looking a little bit at safety, but you're also looking a little bit in terms of whether to see whether the drug works. And then in phase three is sort of the litmus test. It's the definitive test where we say, well, I'm now going to, I'm going to blind, um, I don't mean actually taking a laser and blinding you, but blinding means that you don't know what drug you're on. You can be on, on the dummy pill, you can be on the real thing. Sometimes instead of dummy pill, they give you like so-called the standard of care approach, meaning that is whatever treatment you're getting, let's say transfusion, for example. And then they compare, right? Because the, the person doesn't know it. I don't know if, if, if I'm the doctor treating you, I don't know what it is. Even, even the company that makes the drug doesn't know what, which arm you're in. So uh, after that, then, then you look at the results at the end of the trial, right? You open up the blind and you look at it. You can look at the results. If, if the results is good, then that means you can start looking for approval by different uh, regulatory bodies like Health Canada, for example. So that's, that's sort of the, the journey from phase one to three. So in, you can see that there are a lot of them that has actually completed phase one. And you can you you will see later on that in Canada as well as Ontario we're actually involved in in a number of studies with these new promising agents. Uh, these are the ones that have tried in the past but failed to pass through. Now this may seem a lot to you, but on average only seven percent 
of any drugs that's being tested pass through from phase one to phase three. 7%, so seven out of 100. So you can see that there will be a lot of compounds littered in, in the graveyard. Um, so let's start with pyruvic kinase activators, okay? So what is pyruvic kinase activator? If I can bring you back to uh, first year university chemistry or even back in uh, high school in chemistry, uh, there is a thing called glycolysis. It's a pathway where we make energy. is 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 important in everything from bacteria all the way to humans. It's 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 ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And at the end of this pathway is this um, is this enzyme called pyruvate kinase. And pyruvate kinase makes the one last energy uh, battery called ATP. Now. Everything needs ATP for it to run. I mean, the reason I'm moving my hands right now is ATP. The reason I'm talking to you right now is because of ATP. In a sickle red cells, however, because it's so hard to maintain the, the proper shape because of the uh, sickle, uh, sickle hemoglobin binding together, um, it uses a lot of ATP to, to in order to try to fix it in shape. But even then, it doesn't work. And this is why it's sickles. You can imagine though, however, that if we can somehow boost the amount of energy inside a red cell, then perhaps we can then rescue the sickle cells from, from being bent out of shape. And, and indeed, we do uh, studies in the test tube. We can see here on the bottom right-hand corner that we can actually prevent it from sickling when the amount of oxygen gets lower and lower. So at the bottom, the blue curve is without the medication, uh, the pyruvic kinase activator, and then the top one is with the pyruvic kinase activator. Not only that, by having pyruvic kinase activator, we can also reduce or uh, drop the uh, demand of 2,3-DPG. Now, the reason why 2,3-DPG is crucial is because it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the compound that when there's a lot of it in the blood, it can actually make the hemoglobin to unload or to drop oxygen. Now, we don't want the hemoglobin to drop the ball, right? To drop the oxygen, because if it starts dropping oxygen, it's gonna start sickling. So we don't want it to do that. But by reducing the amount of 2,3-DPG, we can actually prevent the hemoglobin from dropping the ball, and so it prevents the sickling. Or at least this is what we think should happen. So the first drug where um, a number of centers in Ontario and in Canada are participating in uh, is called Metapivat or AG348. In the first phase, phase one uh, multiple ascending dose study, it was shown to increase hemoglobin by an average of 12 points, uh, reduces the uh, hem hemolytic markers, or these are break markers that looks at breakdown of blood, it reduces the 2,3-DPG by 42% and reduces the P52. P50 is sort of the point in which it sickles, uh, sorry, in which it unloads oxygen. In the phase two study where we're looking at, you know, uh, people, again, with people with sickle cell disease, we were able, uh, they were able to show that there were, again, there was a consistent increase in hemoglobin from 93 to 105 on average. Uh, the amount of reticulocytes also reduces, uh, the breakdown products also reduces the ability to move in the LDH, the P50 also shifts lower, and the point of sickling also goes lower, as you can see. And, it's, and it looks like it's a dose-dependent effect. Well, well, higher doses that we go, the, uh, the, the greater the effect it is. And so based on these data, um, there's now a study called Rise Up, which again is, is, uh, is running in, um, in a number of centers in Ontario. Uh, what we're looking at in the phase two is comparing two doses of the drug with placebo, and then people can go on an open label extension for uh, four years. Uh, once they have found the, the right dose, then, then that dose will be used for the phase three study. And we are looking at recruiting you know, 69 patients in the phase two and 198 patients in the phase three. The, another drug, which is a competitor of Mitapiva, is called Itavopivat. Well, they all sound the same, right? Piva. So it probably works around the same mechanism. And indeed, it does work the same mechanism. Uh, this drug, um, what again, they have shown very similar um, uh, results like uh, Mitapiva, the previous drug. Again, increases hemoglobin, decreases the point of sickling, reduces, uh, it changes the point in which the, um, the hemoglobin uh, offloads oxygen, it, it, it increases def uh, deformability, and it reduces um, a lot of the, uh, um, it reduces the point of sickling. So again, based on these results, they're engaging in a phase two, three study, 
where they're looking in, in sickle cell patients, uh, adolescents and adults. They're also looking at adults who are on transfusion. And they also, there's also a pediatric arm that's uh, current, uh, that the study will start running at SickKids. Next one is CSLA89. CSLA89 is interesting because it's actually a human product. So uh, you know how you donate blood, right? And you get these things called plasma. Plasma is sort of the, the liquid portion of the blood. And in there is a protein called hemopexin. Hemopexin can reduce the toxicity of the breakdown product of the red blood cell. So the idea here is that if we have a lot of these purified hemopexin, we can actually reduce the toxicity of the breakdown product of sickle cell disease. And in the phase one study, they've shown that they were indeed, they were able to lower the amount of, um, uh, of these uh, breakdown products. Uh, they're able to let sickle cell move faster uh, once they've infused these, uh, these, uh, this compound called hemopexin. And so now there is actually an upcoming phase two study, which is some centuries of the very well participate. Last but not least is that I'm going to talk about my uh, my favorite drug. I'm a bit biased to it because um, uh, this is actually one of uh, one of the drugs that I'm trying to develop right now uh, through a grant with the National Institutes of Health. Um, we call it PB04, but it's actually a drug that's been used in Parkinson's disease for four decades now. In fact, it's used as a drug to to boost the amount of another drug called L-DOPA. So it's, it's a sort of cold drug. It doesn't really work, does anything by itself. But serendipitously, what we found is that PB04 is able to increase the amount of fetal hemoglobin in the, in the blood. And as, as many of you know, fetal hemoglobin is the good hemoglobin. And so we'll be starting uh, the, uh, the sickle cell cohort very, very soon in this study. Um, so last question is, you know, given that we're trying to attack multiple areas of this mechanism here, of this pathophysiology, is there one silver bullet or is there maybe strikes multiple targets? And then the question also is when to strike, right? Should we start early when, when it's just uh, pe people are just in, in babies or, or as they were kids rather than adults when a lot of complications have already developed? I think factors that we need to consider in the treatment of sickle cell disease is that we are often dealing with therapies that could be high risk, but very high reward. For example, bone marrow transplant, which you'll hear later, and, and, and cell therapy, uh, which provides a cure. But then there's also these drugs called disease modifiers, like the ones I've presented to you right now that can control the disease, but doesn't change the underlying problem, right? Doesn't change the underlying genetics. So, so it's not necessarily a cure. Um, now, all these things, I think we need to take into account that things like accessibility, you know, inclusiveness of the drug, uh, of, 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 the, uh, of the people that are, that are being used. Are we trading for one complication versus the other? I, I truly applaud uh, everyone who, uh, in the audience who have participated in the clinical trial because you guys are adopters, you guys are explorers, and, and I want to thank you uh, for, for your, your bravery in, in being able to participate in these clinical trials. Not only once we, we know that a drug works, of course, it, it needs to get approved, but beyond approval, we've got to look at things like funding, right? We've got to make sure that there's equitable access. And how do we ensure that? We need to level at different, different uh, uh, levels of government. We need to uh, go to the federal level, talk to CADF, which sets the, the evidence-based uh, cost of the drug. We need to talk to uh, PCPA, which is a negotiating body between the provinces and the drug companies to, to make sure that there's equitable access of the drug for everybody. We need to talk to the provincial public fund formularies so that, you know, it's not, so that the funding uh, criteria is not based on some arbitrary definition that has nothing to do with the disease status of the patient. There is a national drug strategy for high cost drugs for rare diseases that are being built uh, by on the federal level right now. And I encourage you to be engaged in this process. And I know that Scago and SCDAC is involved in this as well. And with this, I thank you for your attention.
Wow. Thank you, Dr. Cole. That was a comprehensive overview. I, I mean, I obviously have a number of questions, but I will hold them until the question and answer period. But that was great. Thank you so much. So following up that great presentation, we have Gabriel Bede, who's going to spend some time sharing his lived experience and what will be now the one year anniversary of his bone and marrow transplant. So Gabriel, over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for um, having me um, on this panel and getting to speak to everybody. Um, so my name is Gabriel Badejo, um, and uh, I, I underwent a bone marrow transplant last year. Um, yesterday was actually my one year anniversary. Um, and um, I was diagnosed um, at one years old with uh, sickle cell disease SS. And, um, you know, as um, you probably are aware, I've had my bouts with a bunch of crisis and, you know, a bunch of different issues with my um, organs and stuff like that. And um, what led to, um, I guess, like a big thing, because there's no, um, there isn't, I did a, a trial, and I believe I might have been the second person in Ontario to, to do this. Um, uh, there's, there's a, a question might be like, how do you get um, to um, the opportunity to do a trial and stuff like that. And I, I'm not really sure how, how it works. Um, uh, a, a physician would be able to talk about how it works on the back end. But for me, um, I had a pretty serious uh, crisis um, back in 2018. Um, and I guess that led uh, my uh, hematologist to refer me to this clinic. And um, I guess uh, at that time, um, I, I didn't, I've heard of, of a bone marrow transplant being a thing, um, like in my research, like way back when, um, but I didn't think it would ever be accessible. And also to, um, uh, at the, I guess when I was doing my research, how they did the, um, how they extracted the bone marrow, um, uh, the bone marrow um, to give to a new patient, was very invasive and I didn't want to ever want to put my a family member um, through that kind of thing where they're like drilling in a in their bone or something like that to extract bam, bone marrow um, for like my sake. So I just never really thought that was ever going to be an option in life uh, for me. Um, so, but um, when uh, my doctor um, mentioned this trial, I, I mentioned that concern and he kind of like told me how things have progressed in how they give bone marrow transplants and bone marrow transplants are done a lot with patients um, with cancer. Um, and there's been a, a lot of progression, how they do things there and it's not as invasive. And it was actually um, honestly seemed pretty simple. Um, pretty much they give um, the donor um, an injection for a f um, some days and then they go in to um, a clinic and they just hook you up to a machine where it's a, like you're getting an IV or blood transfusion and they remove the, they cycle through the, um, they remove your blood uh, and they take out the, the stem cells that they need and then they put your blood back in you. And is there a pretty um, simple experience. Uh, my sister was a donor, so she had to had to do it, and she said it was um, it was pretty um, simple for her. Um, of course, it, um, there was times where it was hard because she had to be really strict about the timing of the, of injecting um, the medication. Um, but after after um, she was done, it was all good. She she didn't have she was good. Like the same day. She didn't have any like complications or anything. Um, and uh, also um, kind of what made me say yes to, um, made me like seriously consider um, this treatment. One was that I knew that it wouldn't be like super invasive for a donor. Um, and then also um, I actually had to give it a lot of thought because, um, because the, it's a, it's pretty risky. 
um, you know, and you never, there's so much unknowns and you just don't know um, how, um, how things can manifest or how things are going to change and um, what it means if it doesn't work, you know, um, and which is like pretty much compounding illness on top of illness and, and stuff like that. Um, but I think for me, um, uh, one, I'm like kind of a risk taker as a, as a person. I, I like to like, you know, just throw things on the line. But I think a big thing for me was that like, you know, if I'm going to, if I have an opportunity to kind of like um, use uh, myself as a caveat to like more research to kind of like further what we're doing in, in um, this space, um, I'd like to be a, a part of that. And um, I'm, I'm willing to um, like take on that risk to hopefully benefit other patients with sickle cell. And, um, and if it's successful, like, you know, I, I want to just like get the word out because there's just not a lot of awareness or funding and things for, um, for sickle cell. Um, so I think that was a, a big thing for me. So that led me to like say yes. And also the big opportunity of, <clears throat> of not having to feel pain anymore. Um, that was like a, a huge, um, plus, um, so, um, so yeah, so when I um, uh, went in for the for the trial, it was a, a really um, um, good experience. Um, I was had to be hospitalized for about a month and a half, and um, the hospital staff was great. And one thing I'll say for like patients who are who are um, thinking about um, doing this, it's a very weird experience with going to the hospital and not being in pain and going there to not, um, to like, you know, get relief, you know, it was just a, it, I felt like I was just going like to the hospital as a regular person, but it was just a very weird um, experience um, going to the hospital and being admitted under like such different circumstances. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And, um, the the experience was was pretty simple like you you have to undergo a, a form of of chemo um called campath is um the drug that um was used and uh um for me personally it wasn't uh that that crazy like i didn't have like extreme side effects or a bad reaction to it um and and then you ha uh, you do a, a day of radiation um, and that part was a bit tough for me, um, cause I, I did have a crisis that morning and had to do the, um, radiation, but it lasted about a day. And the good thing about being in the hospital already is that when you have a crisis and there's, everybody's kind of aware of what's going on, they were really on it about, um, you know, uh, managing whatever was going on. So it was like, I had a crisis and I got like, immediate care and it didn't even last that long um so that was great um and then the day of the the the, the transplant which is pretty much like a blood transfusion um and they inject um the stem cells into you it's pretty cold um there's a preserver that's used and you might throw out but all in all it wasn't that like it, it wasn't, it didn't feel that like big or crazy in it or anything. And that was like a big um, thing going into this because there's like so much unknowns. Um, like I just imagined this whole thing to be like such a big, like, I don't know, like in a surgery room and knives and needles are like flying all over the place. And that's kind of how I envisioned it, but it wasn't really like that at all. It was like a lot more simple, a lot more calm. And it actually wasn't as scary as I thought it, as I thought it would be. Um, and uh, so since then, um, you, you may lose your hair a bit, which I did. Um, I actually had really long hair before. I'm growing it back now, but I cut my hair before. But you do lose your hair and you do feel um, really pretty weak for, um, you know, a number of weeks. 
But as you start to bounce back, um, you start to feel stronger. And, uh, and honestly, you still might have, have a couple crisis that you might feel as things are working, but it takes time. And like, um, I'm, a, I'm only a year in, um, and, uh, and I, I feel like I kind of had like a slow kind of uh, trajectory because like a lot of things were going on and that my body was taking um, its time to like um, acclimate to what's going on. Um, but um, I feel like I've hit um, as of a, like a, a few months ago, I hit like a, a turning point and now I'm starting to feel like really strong, starting to get energy back. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's actually feeling like, like, um, I'm accepting that this treatment is working and, um, something that's, um, really big and something I'm in the process and going through now is the mental aspect of it. Um, because it's not just, oh, you're getting a transplant that can cure your disease that you live with your whole life and great. But the other thing is that. Um, as an adult, I've lived with sickle cell for so long, and my life has been um, my life has been pretty much catered to how I move around because of sickle cell. And now that's being uh, now that that issue is is going away, like you have to kind of like rethink everything, like how you like move day-to-day your motivations for things and um it's kind of a a tough battle mentally um that you have to to fight and um and um anybody that um is considering this i would like advise that like don't be shy to get um mental help uh health help if you need it um because um you really want to be in a in a place where um you you're mentally where um where your body is as your body's changing your mental um will be changing as well and it's very important that you know they're going in the same direction together um but yeah it's a it's a hard thing like getting used to like even i don't even feel as cold as i used to always feel before but sometimes just because i think things are like too cold for me i won't i won't do it like i went skiing for the first time recently and uh, I, you know, bundled up and stuff like that. But I felt that because I was too cold, maybe I shouldn't try this. Maybe I shouldn't be here as long and, and things like that. So like, there's a lot of, a lot of like different things in the way of life that you'll have to like um, uh, approach differently. And it's not, it's not easy at all. Um, but also um, I, I want to say that um, I'm, with the other participants that have done the trial, um, adults have done the trial in Ontario so far. Um, we've all um, been in contact with each other, and uh, it really helps to talk to somebody that has gone through the treatment. And fortunately, I was able to connect with um, the person that has done the treatment before me. And he gave me a lot of tips and kind of like walked me through things, which was really comforting. And we're all um, really cool with each other now. And um, it's nice to have that support system, but also too, a big thing is that like everybody's body will experience this transplant differently. It's not gonna be the same for everybody. Um, you know, uh, things won't happen exactly how it happened for me, for anybody else. Um, so although like, things have been um, cool for me so far. Um, That doesn't mean that there's still a risk. And sometimes um, things might arise that might seem risky, but it's just your body is tolerating it differently and and it will get to the point where it should be, you know? So I just wanna stress that like, although we, um, although it's like things are working well for us, um, the, those that have done it, um, it hasn't been the exact same experience, um, you know, so when you're listening to stories, just, um, keep that in mind, um, because if you are doing it and you feel like it should happen exactly how somebody, somebody's else experience went, 
and it doesn't happen the same way for you, that might trip you up mentally and stuff. So it's important to keep open and just allow your, give your body the time to do what it needs to do. Um, but yeah, uh, all in all, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm really grateful for, um, all my hematologists and, um, and the staff at PMH, um, that, um, conducted this, uh, transplant for me. And, um, I really hope that, uh, we, um, we get to a point where there's more participants where we can, um, see, uh, you know, a new life for a, a lot of sickle cell patients. And also that like, you know, some people might not be able to qualify for um, a transplant at this point and stuff. And it's important that um, we get the awareness out and we push for funding so we can fund and 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 get more options like a, a, tra a bone marrow transplant or gene therapy is not the only option. There's um, other things and like the drugs that um, Dr. Poe was mentioning earlier um, that uh, we should be striving to push for and push for more because not everything's going to work for everybody, but we need to get to a place where we have enough options to cover everybody. Um, so yeah, thank you for uh, listening and, um, and uh, Godspeed. I hope this helped. Gabriel. I mean, wow. That was a few things. First, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. Thank you so much for sharing your one year anniversary with us. Uh, for this obviously pretty, um, you know, uh, I mean, achievement and milestone in your life. This is fantastic. I mean, these, you provided a wealth of information. I'm sure everybody here um, gained from it. I think your story epitomizes that of a sickle cell warrior. So, I mean, all the power to you, brother. I'm looking forward to hearing more about your adjustments. Looking forward to more skiing and shredding the hills this year for you. Um, and I'm just so happy that you're able to join us. So thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, next, we have joining us Dr. Donna Wall, who will be delivering a presentation on gene therapy and bone and marrow transplant from a pediatric perspective. Over to you, Dr. Wall. All righty, folks. Um, just give me a second. No problem. All right. So that you should have a, the full screen. Yes, indeed. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. I have to tell you, this is the hardest act to follow. And, <laughs> uh, and so um, I just want to thank Gabriel and, and Dr. Ko for um, uh, setting me up for what I'm going to share. Um, and your words of wisdom, Gabe, Gabriel, um, fit exactly what we're running into in, in our uh, patients who are, are, you know, through what we worry about medically, but getting back to full life is something you have to be prepared for and uh, to deal with the challenge. So thank you very much um, for, for sharing. So um, I work closely with Dr. Quo and, and, um, and a big team of uh, team at sick kids uh, with the, the sickle cell hemoglobinopathy service um, and um, our bone marrow transplant program. And I'd like to just share with you uh, some updates um, 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 with um, in, in the area of uh, basically getting it so that we fix the problem. Yeah, and, and while this is a temptation, it's not the answer for everybody. And, and you'll see a little bit uh, going forward. Like Dr. Kuo, I work closely with our industry colleagues, but I'm, I'm in the role of providing technical advice. I've got the bank account that demonstrates um, that there's that um, I'm not I don't have personal uh, uh, monies involved. We nicely had an introduction from Dr. Kuo, and you guys that know more uh, about in the sickle cell process. But at the root of the problem is that. The young blood making that when when you, the young blood making cells have one single point mutation that changes the the nature of how this uh, hemoglobin behaves in the body, uh, and key to this is this mistake um, is in the mature form of red blood of uh, hemoglobin that we make, not in the kind of hemoglobin that we make as babies. And that is going to be an important uh, part of the story going forward. Um, why would we talk about bone marrow transplant to treat sickle cell? Um, it's because 
we have inside our bones a factory that gives us blood for our whole life. And it's driven by very young cells. We call them uh, blood making stem cells or mother cells that give us um, all parts of the blood making system, which includes the immune system, includes the uh, guys that make pus and fight infection, includes platelets that keep you from bleeding and the red blood cells. So we are kind of one trick ponies. And when we do a bone marrow transplant, we replace these very young blood making cells from a donor who has a compatible immune system, okay? Because this new blood making system grows up is gonna replace the blood making system. And that has to be comfortable living in the new, um, uh, in the new body. So you heard Gabriel talk that, talk about his sister, um, you know, had the same immune fingerprint is how I, I like to think about it. Um, and um, draw and was able to, uh, basically, we collect some of her very young blood making cells goes in just like a blood transfusion, and, um, and repopulates the blood making system and replaces the blood making system with normal um, uh, red blood cells. So that's your really quick transplant talk. Um, transplant is a is a big is a big deal, and there are some things that we worry about. One is that um, Gabriel's immune system is very smart. The, the red blood cell system is 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 got a, a bad mistake in it, but the immune system his immune system was very good, and so there's a risk that that of um, his immune system seeing sister's new blood making system as foreign and getting rid of it. And that's called graft failure. And that's why he had the radiation therapy ahead of time uh, and uh, some, uh, some immune therapy uh, to quiet his immune system down. And we also need to make space. So there's basically, I think of it like a garden, we're planting new seeds, we're growing up. The, we need to make space for that new blood making system. Um, to uh, set up shop. We also worry about graft versus host disease, which is the reverse. That's the new immune system coming up from his sister, looking around Gabe's body and saying, hmm, I don't belong here, treating him like a virus or something that needs to be gotten rid of. And it can't, we could be opening the door to a whole nother set of problems. Okay. So we're very, this is something that we're very cautious with and we work very hard to prevent. And when we do a transplant, um, there are risks of something really bad happening, bad infections, the kidneys can complain, liver can complain, neurologic can, uh, system can complain. And these are, um, there are some special issues that happen in patients who have had sickle cell disease for a long time, where if there's problems in the kidney already, or if there's problems in the blood vessels in the brain already, there's increased risks or problems that we can run into. And then finally, there's an availability of a donor. Um, only about you know, 10%, 10%, 20% of, um, of um, patients that I consult on have a, will have an immune matched um, brother or sister as a donor. And so we are, and so that's, I'll, I'll get a little bit more uh, talking about that later on. We have at SickKids, we've had a trial, we call it the SUN trial. Um, and for children who have um, immune match donors like Gabriel and his sister, uh, similar to what, uh, and, and the strategy here, this is a unique strategy for transplant for patients with sickle cell anemia. Okay, so, and, and because what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize uh, some side effects and, 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 and dealing with the reality, we have a really strong immune system in there. And so um, uh, Campath or alemtuzumab is, um, is, is one uh, agent, and that's an, uh, that's an antibody that uh, basically um, uh, quiets down the patient in the, in the few weeks right around the transplant to give the donor cells a, um, a leading edge on, on, um, getting, on bypassing that really smart immune system. We also use radiation therapy. Um, it's a dose that is one fifth of what I would use in a patient with leukemia. So, but we treat it with respect and it's, it does the heavy lifting and making some space for the seeds to set, to set up shop. And then we give the young blood making uh, cells back in just by an IV infusion. 
One of the tricks we have is that the first wave of immune cells coming up and any leftover immune cells uh, that Gabriel might have um, we quiet them down with a drug called sirolimus. And, and if you're a, a cooking kind of person, we, we take the approach of low and slow. Um, we give uh, sirolimus over um, um, many months to a year, maybe even two years, until the, that new um, immune system gets itself fully situated and sets up shop and supports um, the lifelong blood making from the donor cells. So we our early re results at Sick Kids, um, we've treated eight uh, kids in the last few years, and and we're working with other centers, um, supported by uh, the Doris Duke Foundation uh, trial, and uh, so a total of thirty seven kids have been treated. Treatment's been very well tolerated, um, and but and the only the, the risk that we've run into is not so much the graft versus host disease, but the other is that the kid's immune system is just too darn good and it's uh, kicking the graft out in about one in 10 or, you know, uh, patients. So we're working on imp improving um, the, the uh, sort of getting it so that we're not gonna see as much graft failure. But right now, th these results are, are so good and it's so well tolerated. And you got that theme from Dr. Ku's talk. Um, we, need, we need the treatment if we're doing transplant to be safe. So this has now become our standard approach to, to transplant um, at SickKids. Um, and in the last um, six months or so, we're now um, using the same tool for patients who have a mismatch in blood group, um, uh, which has been, had been a hurdle um, going forward. Importantly, we're, put, we're developing our next generation of trial so that we can use a half match brother, sister, parent as donor. Once we can do that safely, that blows, that really min, it gets, opens up the door to making transplant an option for a much larger um, group of patients. I do have a question and, and we'll be coming to Skago uh, to set up some um, parent, some patient parent focus groups, discussion groups. Um, and that goes to when should we consider doing a transplant? In the pediatric side, many patients have mild disease, especially since uh, hydroxyurea has been, uh, been used. And one of the questions we, we are struggling with how, how to deal with, and we're finding that parents are on a different page than us, to be honest with you. Um, we historically have said, you have to have had that really bad crisis. You have had to have you know, some uh, complications from your sickle cell disease. Um, before we will go to transplant. Parents are saying to us, you know, this doesn't make sense to us. You know, we want our kids, our kids, and the kids are telling me too, you know, I, I have a donor. I want to do the, I know the disease. I know what it, it looks like. I, I want to get the transplant done before we have serious problems. And this is, this is a real tough question for us. And so, um, you know, with, with our hematology team and, and with the, um, uh, hopefully with Skago and, and now that we have a growing community of patients who understand what transplant is and isn't, we're hoping to get some help um, going forward. Another strategy, and I'm switching over to the gene therapy, is that, well, the problem with sickle cell disease is that there's a mistake in the adult form of blood making cells, okay? If we can correct the very young mother cells so that they will only make the baby form of red, of red blood cell hemoglobin, we should be able to fix the problem or at least make it a whole lot better. So heck, we know how to do a bone marrow transplant. What if we take a patient's own young blood making cells and correct them so that they forget how to switch from making baby blood uh, to adult blood um, and set, set, the, set the patient up to, um, uh, to have um, treatment, uh, to uh, set the patient up so that they, they'll just make the baby blood. And the 
we know now this is based on, you know, we're walking on, you know, we're climbing up on the shoulders of um, hundreds of spe spectacular uh, hematologists, scientists, researchers uh, um, uh, who have explored over, over the years, what happens right around the time of birth. This is the time of birth. This is the ba the blue line is the baby hemoglobin initially is all the hemoglobin you make when you're inside the womb. Then right around the time of birth, you switch over and you start making the adult hemoglobin. We all, we knew clinically that patients with sickle cell disease did fine for the first, you know, several months of life, you know, they, they didn't run into trouble, but it was only after this switch happened. And then the sickle, sickle, sickle cells took, took over that we ran into trouble. So our goal with the gene therapy right now, and there's, and I'll, um, there is to just keep the fetal hemoglobin going. And the, one of the drugs you heard Dr. Ku talk about was taking that same approach to let's just get this fetal hemoglobin up. Similarly, hydroxyurea will get hemo, a fetal hemoglobin up. And we know from our clinical experience that um, as if there's, there's a wide range around the world of where, how much fetal hemoglobin is in the bloodstream in, in populations. And we've known for years that some people from some parts of the world have what, what I call hard sickle cell disease, you know, bad crises. And then others, they, sickle cell is not that bad a disease. Um, and what was found is that those populations tended to have higher fetal hemoglobin. There's a few rare families around the world that all they do is make fetal hemoglobin. Um, and those patients, if they also have the sickle uh, gene in it, they did not have crises. So we've had, we had that clinical experience that said, gee, this looks like it, you know, this looks like a reasonable idea. We know from our experience with hydroxyurea that as you increase the fetal hemoglobin, this the amount of sickling uh, sickle crises go down. So uh, the guys in the lab have been quietly piecing away what happens genetically, uh, molecularly in the switch from making the um, um, the baby hemoglobin over to making the adult hemoglobin. One of the key switch controllers, and it lives on a different um, uh, gene, uh, different chromosome completely, way, way away, um, is called BCL11A. Um, what if we, and, and it was found out that if you take BCL11A out of action, there's actually some families around who just by accident have this defect, and so we know it can happen in nature. Um, what if we take it out? And then with our gene therapy tools, uh, we can actually come in and laser focus and only take out the BCL11A that is driving red cells, not other, other kinds of blood cells in the body. So very focused, targeted uh, gene, uh, gene strategy. Um, and to do that, we're using a new technology called CRISPR-Cas9, and that got the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. So you know, very new technology. But what we can do is target incredibly specifically right to that um, area in front of the uh, BCL11A um, uh, gene. And CRISPR is this whole you know, complex. It's actually for how bacteria um, keep viruses out of them. So it, it, this, is, this came from the guys who do you know, um, really nerdy basic, basic science. But with that, um, this whole, this complex that includes how to get there. It includes this blue blob is, is called a, a caspase. And anytime you hear an ase, it's an enzyme. So it's cutting. And so, and then a very specific piece of DNA, because we understand right down to, you know, in great detail, what's right before that BCL, that uh, around that BCL11A. We specifically target it. And then in a, basically it's a chemical reaction. We cut it um, and, um, and break the, uh, cut the cord. We pull the plug on the uh, BCL11A being able to tell the body to switch from making baby hemoglobin to adult hemoglobin. So we keep you in uh, baby hemoglobin mode. 
What does the treatment look like? The treatment looks like just like Gabe described to us. It looks a lot like a transplant, okay? This is a first in man approach. This is, and there, this is an area, there's a lot of research going on where, you know, we're, we're, we're incredibly excited about it, but we are the first model, you know, coming down the, down the line. So what we do is we, from the patient, a lot of screening and, and um, uh, that goes on to make sure that a, a patient is strong enough, well enough, and has bad enough sickle cell disease. And this, we, we actually, before the two patients with sickle cell disease were treating in Toronto, we screened, oh gosh, close to 30 patients who either weren't sick enough or were too sick, you know, uh, for, for the treatment. Um, if they had a match brother, sister, that, that was priority. So we're going at, uh, we're, we're targeting patients who, who didn't, don't have options. We collect their young blood making cells. Um, and we ship them to a uh, special uh, uh, manufacturing location that pulls out those young blood making cells into, into, a, te into a test tube. Um, and in there, that complex called the CRISPR Cas9 editing complex is, um, is put into the bag and the cells are given this uh, electric current we call it electroporation. And this big, big thing um, uh, goes into the cells does its cutting, and then we freeze them down um, and do a ton of testing on it to make sure that it's okay. Um, and then we have to make space. Okay, so um, uh, Gabe talked about the radiation therapy um, and the alumtuzumab. Here, we're coming back in with a patient's own cells. So we don't have to worry about the fighting because these guys know how to live in their body, right? So that part is easier. Um, but we, we use a drug called busulfan, which is a chemotherapy drug. It's given over four days. It's got its own side effects. So this falls under big deal category. Um, we then, once, um, once the medicine's out of the system, we just give just like a blood transfusion, uh, the corrected blood cells, and then we wait. The, similar to Gabe, the hospital stays about six weeks. And then, uh, and then we follow up as that immune system, uh, just in, without patient visits. Um, I am at this point, this is um, early study. Uh, I can only show you slides for the first three patients. I'm going to have to ask you to use your imagination and add a zero to it because there's been 30 patients around the world treated. The results are staying straight um, uh, with that. So, um, and and basically things that Kev, Dr. Ku is looking for is how long did it take for the white blood cell count to recover? What does the platelet count look like? And how long uh, has the follow-up been, been? So this is what I'm showing you is the results of eight months of follow-up. We're now at two and a half years of follow-up and things are holding steady. These are the first three patients in their two years before coming to transplant, these guys had what I call hard sickle cell, seven crises, seven and a half crises, four crises a year. They had the treatment and after the treatment, all of them have very satisfying increases in their hemoglobin in the, you know, this is uh, 120 uh, to, you know, 130 um, grams per liter in Canada, we do grams per liter. Um, and, um, what was impressive is um, the amount of red cell breakdown went down you know, next to zip to zero. What's I'm worried, I'm, I'm watching the most as a transplant doctor is we made the correction, but did we make that correction, correction in the youngest of youngest of blood making cells? And the, this now is following, out, is following out to two years and the correction in the young blood making cells that we had from what, how much correction we had in the test tube to what we actually see in the patient's blood, make, blood making. And so these kind uh, study participants have bone marrow tests at six months, a year, and two years after treatment has stayed stable all the way through. And that has us incredibly excited that this is going to give us meaningful correction for, for a long time. There is a worry here is that the, is whether there's going to be a risk of leukemia. Using a different kind of gene therapy uh, that uses a virus to get to do the correction. Uh, there, there was a warning that there were a few patients who um, developed 
either pre-leukemia or leukemia. Um, there's, and so this, you know, put a pause on treatment. It has not been seen with the CRISPR studies to date. Um, and there's now been over 100 patients, both with thalassemia and sickle cell disease, who've been treated, and we're watching very carefully. But there's increased appreciation that, that there is a, a small increased risk for leukemia in patients with sickle cell anemia, just period. And that where when we push the blood making system by, you know, pulling out young blood making cells, correcting them in the test tube and then putting them back in that we might be uh, forcing the system too much. So we're, we're watching that, we're, we're being very cautious um, on, on that. So with everything, there's risk benefit. And um, the same theme that from Dr. Ku, I, I am just so, I've, I've learned so much in running this trial and, and working with, our, with the patients who considered the treatment, their bravery, their their willingness to you know to 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 go into the unknown because this is really the unknown. Um, it has been uh, what we're doing today is built on you know may, literally thousands of people researching um, and studying and observing and interpreting um, how you know how patients with sickle cell uh, um, experience their disease and and. The, uh, the responses. This is a big team that is doing this. I'm talking for the team today, but we have transplant specialists, hematologists, uh, genetic specialists, and uh, the primary care docs and nurses. And importantly, uh, we do need to continue and working and increase our work in building, in having you guys give us feedback on our research agenda. Um, and so uh, with that, I'll just, um, uh, I'm saying the same thing again. So with that, I'll just uh, close. Thank you so much, Dr. Wall. And, and I really appreciate you charging the audience with, you know, picking up the mantle and getting engaged when opportunities are presented to um, not only inform um, care, inform the modalities that are being applied, but also to, you know, champion um, their own initiatives. So I, I really appreciate that. And I think it's important that we definitely do have uh, folks involved at all stages of clinical trials to ensure that they meet the needs of those who are actually going to be engaging in them. So thank you for that, Dr. Wall. Um, so moving right along, we're a bit behind, but we definitely want to make sure we get folks all of the time they deserve. So uh, Ms. Bombo is going to be presenting or sharing with us her lived experience as a parent of both a bone marrow donor and recipient of a transplant. So over to you, Kay. Hi, I, um, yes, my name is uh, actually Kaembe um, Bombo and Mrs. Bob. Um, I am uh, a mother. Um, I, we are, this is a first, so please bear with me. <laughs> I have to gather all my ideas. You're great. Um, um, Faith have played a big part in this journey, a sickle cell journey for my family. Uh, I'm, um, we are coming from uh, the Congo, um, Democratic Republic of Congo. And my husband and I, uh, basically, before we got married, we uh, went, we ask ourselves, what, what's your group type, your blood type? Because we only knew about that. I was, uh, oh, it was A. I was like, okay, that's fine. We can get married. We didn't go further because we didn't know, um, we were not aware of the genotypes uh, testing uh, that has to, to be done. And so uh, we have four children and our baby, um, he's the, um, he was born with uh, sickle cell. And uh, so it's just like the uh, statistic says one out of four, He's number four. <laughs> and um, so he, um, we have three boys and one girl. And so um, our journey with Circosa was not easy being uh, a risk analyst. So I had a busy career. My husband had a, big, a busy career as well. And um, with a sickle cell patient, uh, my son was a uh, basically diagnosed when he was uh, three months old. They did uh, his testing at birth and uh, he was, uh, he started with uh, adroxyria as well as um, amoxicillin and the vitamin Ds. Uh, so uh, everything he has to uh, 
uh, start with. So for us, it was not easy because we were given like a protocol uh, for every time something happens with him, uh, take him to the hospital, don't give him Tylenol, don't give him Advil, just take him straight to the hospital. And when you go to the hospital, you have to stay there two days. And you know, you only get six, uh, six days <laughs> at work uh, a year. So uh, this was quite challenging because one of us would go and then use their days. And at the end, you don't have any days. And um, uh, going to the hospital, they were not really aware of how to take care of us. Uh, we had to tell them we are priority. They're like, no you know what, everybody else is here. Um, so that's until our family doctor went to a conference and then heard about uh, sick kids uh, with their uh, hematology uh, department. So uh, they referred us to um, Dr. Odame, who was the one that was seeing uh, uh, our son. And um, he um, was pretty good. We, voices our, we voiced our uh, concerns and we knew from the beginning that we wanted the, the bone marrow but at that time uh, it was one year old and that was back in 2015 and like Dr. Donna said uh, you had to, to be uh, like uh, having really uh, strokes or you know the case has to be really Serious, serious. But with adroxyria, uh, my son never had a uh, pretty bad crisis. He just had joint pain. And uh, the only time we went to the hospital because he had a chest pain was uh, just a few months before he went for the transplant. So he was pretty uh, good, but the fevers, you had to go to hospital, have the IV and, and, and everything else. So sickle cell really impacted my family because uh, we couldn't go to church. Being a Christian family, we had to uh, be careful. He, um, he had to miss uh, school. Uh, he being a little behind, you can't gather, have friends. We have, you know, everything else. So when uh, we were told about the SON trial um, by uh, Dr. KY, um, we, they approached us, we said, okay, the first um, transplant bone marrow, we were not qualified, but we were, didn't really feel like uh, we, that we wanted to go through that process because uh, being African uh, <laughs> and, and uh, like I said, our faith played a big part. One of the um, side effects would have been that our son couldn't, might not be able to have children. And we, will, we were not feeling that we will uh, un endorse that uh, decision and be responsible for that. We felt like, you know what, this is the decision he will want to make himself and not the, uh, so. Then um, we were approached, like I say, by Dr. K.Y. for the um, for the, the son trial, and uh, we decided to to go through it uh, as well because of the uh, donors' um, risk being reduced. Um, our children were tested. We had two that were um, possible donors, so we had uh, one our daughter and then uh, our son that were possible. So um, they had to look into both of them and see which one would be the best uh, um, possible donor. And um, so You're we uh, out a little bit. had the right. process where the blood was taken out. It was from the floor. Am I You're good now. Yeah. You seem to be good better now. Sometimes if we stop video, it, mm -hmm. it, it helps with bandwidth. So maybe we can do that too. Go ahead, Kay. Kay, are you still there? I see you, but I can't hear you. Yeah, I see you too. Perfect, continue. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, it was my internet that was a little unstable. 
Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yes. Yes, so I was saying um, then uh, we went to the Sun trial and uh, the, the uh, donors uh, were, um, the blood was taken and um, our son went through the chemo uh, radiation and uh, we were, we stayed at uh, sick kids uh, for over a month. Uh, so uh, 2019, it was when um, he went through his uh, his uh, bone marrow, and so it's uh, going to be three years uh, after that. And he was uh, the first uh, one of the first three to go through uh, that process. Uh, he had a catheter put in, and um, from a busy. Uh, a uh, risk analyst mom, I became a nurse because uh, I had to learn how to flush the catheter. I had to learn how to uh, mix the medication. Uh, so I was also a pharmacist, I would say. Uh, so um, our son, uh, Christopher, is doing great. And he's uh, back to school, um, um, started all his immunization again because with this... Uh, um, process everything was wiped out so um, it's it started that and uh, yes so that's basically our journey with uh, sickle cell uh, uh, and the now uh, BMT uh, uh, fellows that are following uh, us so <laughs> that's uh, that's it thank you for having me thank you so much Kay I mean once again a testament to all the great mothers that my, so mine included, you were, like you mentioned, a risk analyst and you became a pharmacist and you became a nurse and you're once again a sickle cell warrior. So it's just a testament to how great mothers are picking up the mantle and being there for their children. So I commend you for not only your journey and this whole transplant experience, but also for being a shoulder and a, and a, and a, a, a guiding force for your little one. So thank you for joining us. Um, and rounding out our session today, who is going to be providing a, um, a, an orientation to the patient and public engagement practices that we talked about a little bit about with Dr. Wall's presentation. Uh, Dr. Don Richard from uh, Dr. Don Richards from the Clinical Trials Ontario will be kind of preventing, presenting a bit of uh, insight on the patient recruitment, consenting, and rights during clinical trials, um, and outlining the privileges and rights of all participants. So over to you, Dr. Richards. Thank you, Delaney. Um, I'm so appreciative of the invitation to be here today and to be privileged enough to follow up after hearing um, both Gabriel and Kay's stories. So thank you for sharing those experiences with us, as well as Drs. Wall and Co. Um, I was privileged to be on a Scalgo webinar almost exactly two years ago with both of them. So it's really fascinating to see where things have come over the past two years with respect to potential therapies and clinical trials. So I'll be talking about some resources that are available for you about clinical trials. And these have been co-built with patients and the public. So I'll just talk briefly about the organization I'm here representing today, and then I'll go straight into some of the topics uh, that Delaney has already introduced that I'll be speaking about today. So Clinical Trials Ontario, you, you can read about our vision and mission, but basically we're primarily supported by Ontario's Ministry of Colleges and Universities to help make Ontario a better place to do clinical trials. And while we are an Ontario-based organization, everything that I'm going to talk to you about today is applicable to clinical trials all across the country. And our resources are all available both in English and French under our patient public um, side of our website. So three things that CTO does, we help people who are doing clinical trials by streamlining some of the processes. Uh, Drs. Ko and Wall didn't talk about all of the work that goes into actually starting up a study as well as carrying out a clinical trial. And that's some of what we do as an organization. We also promote Ontario as a place to do clinical trials. Um, that does help people uh, be able to participate in studies um, before others are, if that's what they choose to do. 
And Ontario's also got a really diverse population, as well as a lot of really great clinicians and researchers and others who are part of the clinical trial system. So we do our best to promote that. The work that I'm involved in is the pillar in the middle, which is the engage pillar. And the work that I do is really to help engage patients and the public in two ways around clinical trials. One is to help you make decisions about participation. And we've heard a lot about that today, that it's a really personal decision and we wanna give you credible and trustworthy information so you can make that on your own. And the second um, way that we encourage engagement is a little bit about what Dr. Wall talked about. And that is with respect to understanding experiences and helping design um, better research studies that really meet the needs of, um, of the people who are living out there and have these unmet needs. So a bit of basic information about trials to start off with. And again, I really wanna highlight that the work that I do is in collaboration with patients as partners. CTO has what we call our college of lived experience. So they're people from across Ontario that live with different conditions. They've had different healthcare experiences. They're different ages. They live all um, in urban and rural settings. So they really bring many perspectives and help us build what we do. And for many years, we've worked with patient organizations and health charities, such as Scago. Um, Lanray came to us many, many years ago to talk about how we might work together. So I, I give Scago a lot of credit for really seeking um, evidence-based partnerships. And, and today is a testament to that. So everything that I'm going to talk to you about comes to you from our website. And um, there's a, a screenshot here of it um, today. On the upper right hand corner of the screen, you'll see there's a patients and public tab. And so everything that I'll talk about, you can feel free to explore. There's lots more information there for you. And as I mentioned, it's all available in English and French if that's helpful for you. Uh, furthermore, I'm going to talk to you a lot about what's on our Learn More web pages. And so you'll see it if you take a look at it. It's kind of structured around where you are in terms of making a decision about clinical trials. So starting off on the left, maybe you're fairly new to it. You just want to understand more about some of the terms, like Dr. Ko was talking about the different phases of clinical trials. So that's all um, hopefully in fairly easy to read language for you there. Maybe you're looking for a clinical trial. So we've got lots of information there about how you might do that. And then, you know, even what to expect when you're in a clinical trial or when you're finished a clinical trial. So we've got lots of frequently asked questions there, some responses, and we've even got some videos there um, for you from different perspectives, like the research ethics board and what their job is, as well as clinicians who do clinical trials. So um, one thing to be knowledgeable about is there's something called informed consent um, when you're asked to participate in a clinical trial. And it's really important to know that um, consent is voluntary. So you don't have to participate in a clinical trial. That's your personal decision. Um, you can withdraw consent. So even if you've decided to participate in a clinical trial, you can change your mind. Um, and consent is ongoing. So it's not just being handed um, a bunch of paper at the start that you're asked to read and understand and sign, but you should feel comfortable throughout uh, your time in a study to ask questions, make sure that you're feeling okay about things, um, get answers if you're not. The other thing to know is that if you decide to leave a clinical trial, you can request to have your data and any samples that you provided also removed from the trial. And that may or may not be possible, um, but just so that you know that's a possibility to at least ask about if that's important for you. We've heard a lot today about the fact that um, clinical trials involve both potential benefits and potential risks. And I, I think that both Gabriel and Kay did a really nice job of explaining, you know, some of their reasons for um, undertaking specific um, potential therapies or research studies. 
And, you know, it's really up to the participant to decide if you feel that the potential benefits might outweigh the potential risks. Um, and they will be different for each clinical trial. And so they will be described in the informed consent form that you're provided with at the start of the study. And as I mentioned previously, you know, you should be asking lots of questions about those until you feel that um, you're satisfied and you feel like you can make an informed decision about those potential benefits and risks. And again, um, you know, that's going to be different for, for participants about what they feel that they can live with in terms of potential benefits and risks. So this isn't going to be the same for everyone. Um, it's very personal. I talked briefly about the fact that you can leave a clinical trial, uh, even, you know, after you initially decided that you want to participate. You don't have to provide a reason, um, but you, you may be asked about that. Um, and you are encouraged, you know, before you decide to leave to talk to the study staff or the study doctor ab about your decision. Again, it's all about being informed and, and helping you make the right decision for you. So ask questions, um, you know, ask whatever questions you need to about that. Um, feel free to explain kind of your own thoughts around it. Um, you may also be asked questions about your experience. Um, you may be asked to have some tests done or physical exams, and that's generally to make sure that you can safely leave the study. So it's not just kind of like a cold turkey walk away sort of thing. Um, and important to think about that, that, you know, you may have to go through some things to um, withdraw from the study. And I've also talked briefly already about, you know, whatever you've provided to the study, uh, you can certainly ask for that to be withdrawn. And that may or may not be possible depending on the study parameters. There are lots of different ways to find clinical trials. Um, you know, I think we heard today about being approached by a healthcare provider or a healthcare team. SCOGO does a great job and is really in the know about studies that are underway. Um, some of you too have talked today about the um, hospital, um, for, for example, for sick kids at, that does a lot of research. So that might be an option is to reach out or other um, hospitals or organizations that do research. Sometimes you will hear, especially for phase one studies, um, you'll see them being uh, ads in the newspaper, TV, or radio, um, and, and that's fairly normal. And um, then we've also developed a clinical trial finder that you might find helpful. So this is just a screenshot of our clinical trial finder. Um, it's available on our website and we built it like everything else that we built with patients as partners. And it pulls from a, a larger database called clinicaltrials.gov, which you may have heard of. So we're kind of limited by the information that's in clinicaltrials.gov. Um, but basically on the left-hand side, at the very least, you need to enter a condition like sickle cell uh, anemia or sickle cell disease. And by default, it will search trials happening in Ontario, um, but you can also search trials that are happening anywhere in Canada, uh, in any province or territory or in, in Canada as a whole. And if you can't find anything, you can sign up for alerts when things do become available. So that's another option for you. Um, again, you know, in the interest of knowing your rights as a potential study participant, uh, you can say no if you're offered a clinical trial by a healthcare provider. And I realize that, you know, this might be an uncomfortable position, um, but really that decision is up to you about whether or not uh, you'd like to participate in a clinical trial. It technically should not change your relationship with your healthcare provider. And I, I certainly hope it wouldn't. Um, because this is a, a personal decision that you would make. There are other options. Um, you know, they each carry their own potential benefits and risks. But again, if you are offered a clinical trial, that's not the only option out there. And again, each of these options carries their own potential benefits and risks. Uh, receiving no treatment, changing the form of treatment that you're on, 
or maybe, you know, you've just heard about new studies coming out and you'd like to watch what happens with them uh, before you decide to participate, or uh, maybe you decide to participate in a different research study. There are, I'm sure, other options here too, but all good to talk to your healthcare provider about um, to help you make a decision. We often get asked about, you know, how do I know if a clinical trial is uh, reputable or credible? So these are some of the things you should um, think about and ask about the study. Um, so for one thing, the cost of the clinical trial, such as the study treatments themselves would be covered. Um, you might have to pay some things out of pocket like parking. Uh, I don't know if the site visit is long, you might have to buy some lunch there. Uh, Kate talked about, you know, taking time off work, et cetera. So those might be things you have to consider, but you certainly should not be asked um, to pay for the study treatment or even, you know, pay a sign up fee or something like that. Those should be red flags for you. You might look at the qualifications of the trial team. Uh, you know, people like Drs. Quo and Wall are very experienced in this area. They've been working in this area for many years. And so that might be something that you look at around those who are working in, this, in the, as part of the study team. The clinical trial applications have to be reviewed by a regulatory agency, so Health Canada. They have to be reviewed by what's called a research ethics board that is looking to make sure that the study is being conducted ethically and they're looking at the welfare of the participants in the study. And it also has to be reviewed by the institution or organization where it's taking place. So, you know, at UHN, um, they have to sign off on it. At SickKids, they have to sign off on it. And you should feel free to ask these questions. You know, again, you might feel weird asking them, but, uh, you know, this is really important. This uh, could be your health. And so these are important questions to think about when you're looking into potentially participating in a clinical trial. The last thing I just wanted to highlight is, um, you know, you can you can hear from me here, and there's a bunch of great people who are who are part of today's webinar who've shared a lot of great information, and we also have a, a blog on our website that shares uh, different stories and experiences from many people about clinical trials generally. So we've got a blog up there from um, our regulator, from someone from the clinical trials team at Health Canada and what their role is and what they do. And then we've also uh, got someone from the sickle cell community. So Pamela is there talking about her experiences with SCOGO and even how that's translated to some of the work that she does as a clinical research coordinator. So sometimes we know that hearing Gabriel stories and Kay's stories and, and other stories about people um, being part of the overall clinical trials community or experience is really helpful. And that's part of why we built our blog. So I just wanted to say, uh, wrap up and say thank you for including me as part of the session today. Um, if you have any questions for me about anything that I presented, you can feel free to contact me offline at my email. And then you can obviously find our organization on social media as well too. So thanks very much. And I look forward to participating in the questions next with all my panelists. Thank you so much, Dr. Richards. That was a great summary to a great panel. I really appreciate you kind of rounding out the discussion by letting folks know how best they can get engaged, uh, resources that there are available and also some supports that have been placed to ensure that patients are equal and, and, and active partners in the whole process of building about clinical trials. That's fantastic. So uh, for all our guests and audience members, this is now your opportunity to take advantage and, and participate in the webinar. If you have any questions for any of our panelists, please do feel free to enter them uh, by, by way of the Q&A, or you can also just submit them into the chat box. Um, while you do that, maybe I'll ask a few questions that came to mind during the presentations as I was a participant listening to these great, these great talks. Uh, Dr. Kuo, you mentioned very early on that there are only, you know, such a small number of drugs available for, for members of the sickle cell disease community. And then you provided us with a stat that about 7% of drugs that are even tested make it to phase three. So, you know, compounding that with such as a small number of drugs being made for sickle cell disease community, I had a question in and around what can we do to kind of help promote 
the need for more drugs to one, be entered into the physical, uh, the clinical trials process and two, potentially make it, make it up that uphill battle? I think it's, um, I think it needs to come from the ground up, in, in my opinion. It needs to come from um, patients and families. Um, and, but it can be done through an organized initiative like SCAGO, SCDAC. Um, traditionally, a lot of these um, like, like um, patient organizations have been lobbying government. Uh, in my opinion, government can only do so much because they used to be um, big funders of large clinical research, but they have, because of the success of budget cuts, it really has been scaled back compared to say the fifties and sixties, you know, I'm comparing to sort of post-World War II. Um, uh, you know, fortunately, unfortunately right now, really the, the industry, you know, pharmaceutical companies is really where, where a lot of these big investments are being done. And, and I think, um, lobbying with the government, but also with the companies, I think it's very helpful in bringing clinical trials into Canada. Um, because you see, our population is only one tenth of the United States and also much smaller than the uh, EU. And so a lot of companies, especially in rare diseases like sickle cell, they don't see it as being a quote unquote profitable uh, you know, a market, right? Because it does cost money for them to apply after they develop the drug, it costs them to uh, apply for the license, for marketing. There's a whole um, infrastructure that goes into providing the drug uh, to our patients in, in a specific country. Um, and never mind the bureaucratic red tape and also the, the time. And, and so, you, we somehow have to make it sort of a value proposition to, to them saying that, yes, it's worthwhile to invest, you know, in Canada. And, and also I think the, the other thing we can do is, I think partnership between um, research labs and universities with the patients and patient organizations to develop infrastructure so that we make it attractive for these companies to come in and say, look, there's a world-class facility you know, right just north of the US, you know, why don't we go there instead of going all the way out into say Europe or Asia or other places. Beautiful, thank you for that response. Uh, and so folks, once again, the, the Q and A function is open and I'll just keep rolling with some questions in the interim while you think about some questions. So Gabriel, once again, want to commend you on a great uh, presentation and great exploration of your own experience. I think a really, really interesting insight. You mentioned how, you know, you've lived so long and been battling this disease and you had to kind of adjust and, and you know, get acclimated to your new approach to life. What are some of the steps you've taken to kind of, you know, dismantle those old habits you had prior to letting the disease maybe you know, restrict your movement a little bit to now being able to look at life a bit with a, with a new approach? What are some steps we can share with the, with the folks on the call? Um, honestly, right now, I'm still figuring it out. Like, I, I really don't know. Um, I think, like, one thing I'm trying to do is just, like, acknowledge all the, like, how I was living before because of disease and trying to identify, like, what was affecting me and why I was doing uh, things in a certain way. So, I can approach it better in the future, but like, really, I don't know. Like for instance, um, like I work in the film industry and um, usually if you work on a movie, it takes like, you know, um, like maybe like three, three months, six months, maybe sometimes a year uh, to work on a project and you're there like, you know, full time working crazy hours. And um, for me, because of um, sickle cell, like, um, and I, I didn't want to, I wanted to avoid having a crisis while working in a team. So mm -hmm. I, would, I always worked in short format, um, like, which is like commercials and music videos and stuff, because those shoots are usually a day or two and maybe a, a couple of weeks of prep and wrap or whatever. And that's it. And then I'll be done. I can move on to the next one. And if I do like start to feel sick, I can kind of like break things up and have a gap. Right. So like now that I'm, I'm, uh, I don't really have those um, kind of limitations. I, it's like, it's kind of like, I have to kind of like be 
brave enough to like change and be yeah. like, oh, it's okay for me to do X, Y, and Z now. Like, you know, um, yeah. but honestly, I'm still, I'm still figuring it out. Gabriel, it's, you're so, the humility in your responses are amazing because even though you mentioned you're still figuring out, you just, you know, really identified like two clear steps. One, acknowledge that the change is happening and two, be brave to accept that you can actually approach, you know, life with a new zest and zeal for it. And I think that in itself are two great examples of how you can basically take upon this change, embrace it and start to forget about those old limitations you've had. So if that's what you call figuring it out, bravo, because it's you're doing a really good job. Um, Dr. Wall, I really appreciated your presentation as well. And in there, you mentioned some of the challenges uh, bone marrow, sorry, sickle, patients with sickle cell anemia face in bone marrow transplants, graft failure, graft versus host disease, the immune system rejecting um, you know, some of these procedures. Now, I know this might be outside of the uh, uh, scope of possibilities, but are there any mitigating steps or any type of uh, risk reduction things you want to let folks know about so they can feel a bit more uh, confident about you know, pursuing these procedures? Right, I, I'm going to answer two ways. And, and um, the first is this sun trial approach, which is very similar to what uh, the uh, Princess Margaret UHN team is, is using as well has blown the lid off of in decreasing the amount of uh, side effects and almost to the point where we're working. Uh, I work very closely with Dr. K.Y. Uh, Chang, who's um, um, uh, our lead uh, um, transplanter for sickle cell, for patients with sickle cell anemia. Um, and it towards pretty much an outpatient transplant. Okay, so we've we're, we've gotten side effects down um, to the point where where things are, are going very well. But then I've got my four secrets. Now you know if I give my trade secrets away, um, you know this is this is um, this it's a, a safe space to hear. Yes, yeah, safe space. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so it's um, brush your teeth. And I'm I'm not making I'm not making this up because going through treatment, the weak spot is um, bug germs get up in through the gums. So uh, good, good uh, oral hygiene is important if you have sickle cell disease and you're not doing anything about it because that chronic inflammation that you come with with gum disease is important. Um, and uh, so I'm a pediatrician. So um, so we say good diet. We say eat something green. Uh, listen to your mother. Um, you know uh, for for that um, and keep fit and keep exercise going. Um, and then finally, uh, following Gabe's theme, think to the future. Don't, don't let the sickle cell disease run you. Think, you know, dream big, go big, and that carries you through the treatment phase. And so those are my four secrets. Fantastic. I'll have to document that and share that with the group. So, um, so uh, Kay and Dr. Richards, I have questions for you. But before I go back to my questions, we have a question from a pan, uh, sorry, an audience member. And it reads, my hematologist in the US has said that uh, the Federal Drug Administration, FDA, is most likely going to approve gene therapy next year in the United States. However, he thinks it's too soon. He says patients should be followed for a much longer period. For, for the doctors and researchers on the call, do you agree? How long should a patient be followed before, uh, I guess, approving them for this gene therapy? Kevin, is okay if I go? Yeah. Um, so, so Health Canada for the trial, we're just doing the first in man studies for a correction that we want to last a lifetime. We're at the very, very early days. And the, the, um, the I call them rudely uh, gene jockeys, the guys who are optimizing the gene therapies, they're making discoveries every day. Okay. So this is one where if you, for the gene therapy, um, I'm actually, I struggle with this with, with, in talking to families and knowing that I, I, I'm running the trials. When, you know, when, it, when is it the right time to do the treatment? And we don't have the crystal ball you know, to, uh, to do that. But Health Canada is requiring a 15 year follow up. Okay, so, um, and what Dr. Coase um, slide shows the process between uh, the time a drug is approved by Health Canada and, and the gene therapy is going to be called, is called a drug, okay, even though it's coming from your own cells. The approval process, the CADETH process, the negotiating process, the, um, the provincial process, 
that takes a long time. And the cost, uh, even once approved, the um, uh, the cost is going to be incredibly high. I don't even want to try and put a, a dollar sign on it um, th at this point. So there, it the answer is complicated. A rapidly changing field. B um, um, the approval process is 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 hard, and our our gene therapies don't fit into the box. We're not Tylenol. We're not the flu vaccine. But the poor regulators have one set of rules that they have to work with. And so, you know, it, I know Dr. Ko and, and I know my, I know what I do. I spend a tremendous amount of time, you know, working with the regulators, working with, you know, the, um, uh, the, the providers. And so the, you know, provincial health folks, they're great people and, and they, they, you know, they really want to work with us, but they have to follow the law, the Ontario law, the federal law, you know, and those laws are, are, are written. So we, and, and so I, I, I really say, okay, it's time to change the law. And then, and, and you, you know what they do, they roll their eyes up and they say, yeah, 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 yeah. But you just have to keep, you know, keep, you know, moving along very good, you know, um, grassroots supports with the rare disease community uh, and uh, uh, Skago um, and, and a host of others going forward. Kevin, you're, you're in this zone as well. Yeah, um, from my perspective, and, and I'll tell you what I've observed is that when the FDA comes to decision to approving a particular treatment, there are lots of factors that they put in. It's not just medical evidence. I mean, one would think that they would just be looking at medical evidence, but there's actually a lot of sort of different angles that they're taking in. And, and there's lots of lobby groups. And, and a lot of these lobby groups, um, there is certainly the industry there, but there's also a lot of grassroots organizations, a lot of, um, a lot of parents and caregivers are lobbying. Um, I'll, I'll give you an analogy to this. Um, it's like the, the COVID-19 vaccine, right? Very controversial. Some believe that we, we did not, they did not approve it you know, um, fast enough. Some says that they approved it, you know, too soon. There is a huge range of opinion as to, you know, when it should be approved and, and different people have different comfort levels, right? And also we have to think about um, the urgency uh, to someone who's living with sickle cell disease or who's caring for someone with sickle cell disease. Obviously, if, if I'm caring for someone, you know, I can only imagine, uh, I do have a daughter with chronic disease, so I can kind of imagine how it feels like. I mean, it, knock on wood, but if my daughter was sicker, I mean, I would want the best, you know, I would want the latest drug. The latest doesn't mean necessarily means the best. We have to keep that in mind, but certainly I want to give it a try. So, so different people have different comfort levels. And, and I think this is why we have such a wide ranging opinion as to when a drug should be, in, uh, should be approved. And the FDA in, in some sense is sort of trapped in a rock in a hard place, right? Like like, and, and it's taking a balanced approach in terms of how severe the disease is, what's the consequences, right? Because people are dying every day. We, we know that with sickle cell disease, you know, uh, versus taking, you know, a potentially life-saving therapy, but that may come with some cost. Beautifully said. So we have about five minutes left and Dr. Ko, you may have gone off mute a bit too soon. I think we have one more question that are more or less directed to you and Dr. Wall. Um, it comes saying, what, what are some of the requirements for the, these stem cell trials? Uh, my son has been getting monthly blood exchanges over four years to prevent priapism and crisis episodes. So he hasn't been hospitalized. However, he still has pain crisis episodes. We did ask about the trials. However, we wouldn't qualify as he hasn't been hospitalized. It's been pretty frustrating. So main questions about requirements for the stem cell trials. So for us, priapism counts as a crisis. Um, and here's where it gets tricky um, with being on a trial versus what we call our standard treatment. And, and, and so for standard treatment, um, this would be an indication for transplant. But you need this. This is not medical advice for your son and, and, and should talk with your the hematologist. Um, the, um, but for a trial, they, they have a you know, this is Health Canada. When when Dr. Ku said FDA, he you just insert Health Canada. You know, that's our that's us. Um, but there, it's not a um, it's not at all. Uh, it, they have there's rules, and and so um, 
uh, Dr. Richards will say, you know, there's eligibilities for a trial and they can't, they can't soften them. That's, that's black and white for, for the trial. And uh, we're, we're, we're stuck. Yeah, it's, it's a real catch 22, right? And, and, and in this particular situation that, that uh, um, you, you talked about, it's because you see to, to, to measure uh, whether a, a therapy is successful or not, we need to be able to compare the before and after. And if there's no changes before and after, there could be two reasons. One is that the drug is not working or B, that the alternate treatment that the person is getting right now could be as good as the treatment they are going to, they, they, they are, they are the second treatment that they're gonna receive, the, the experimental treatment. And it's really hard to tease out unless we remove the first treatment and unmask the sort of the, 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 the disease beforehand. I mean, of course, that's not ethical and no one is ever going to do that. And no one's going to subject someone to pain when we know that a particular treatment is working. It's, it's, it's a real tough thing, right? Because at the end of the day, if the company or the trial or me, I can't show the regulators that the treatment is working because I don't see any differences, I can't get it out to the market and share with everybody. They're not going to improve it because they're going to say, well, you know what, there's potential harm in what you're doing, but then there's no, you have not shown me any objective evidence that it works. So why should I approve you? Thank you for that. Um, yeah, actually, yes, Gabriel, for, for sure, please go ahead and um, unmute yourself. Um, hey, so uh, Miss Kate touched on something earlier um, about like fertility and, and uh, doing uh, this procedure might cause like major fertility issues. And um, that is was like a, a big thing that I thought of, but and I'm not sure how it works for kids. I don't know when kids start producing and, and yeah. stuff, but as an adult, um, I did do sperm banking um, because um, I, I do want the option to potentially um, ha have, a, have a family in the future. Um, so I did do sperm banking and they um, did assist, um, the, the, the treatment team did assist, assist with that. Um, so that was um, great. And, and um, yeah, and like I had a lot of, had a, I've always had a lot of thoughts about having a family and stuff with a, as a patient with sickle cell and like, you know, is it fair for me to even consider that, you know, like, I don't know, you know, it's hard to know how long, like you might live and like be around for your kids and stuff. So, but um, now that I have, uh, I feel I have an option. I did want to take that on and, and, and for sure do the sperm banking um, uh, just in case um, I, I'm at a point where I want to do that in the future. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to touch on that quickly. Much appreciated. That's a great insight. Thanks for sharing that, Gabriel. Uh, so folks, we're, we're at time, but we have one last question I want to try and sneak in. Um, is there a site where we can see the data on gene therapy and trials, sorry, on gene therapy trials and how successful sickle cells of these disease patients were or are who went through the process? It's just at early days. Okay. So, you know, you cl clinicaltrials.gov or the Ontario uh, trials site that, that, uh, uh, Don showed us, um, you know, has a list of trials that are open, but they're all at very early stages. And the trial that we're involved with at SickKids is just writing up for for the literature, and it'll it'll uh, it'll be uh, coming out. But that's one of uh, you know half dozen different strategies, uh, but pulled together in in a full story. It's just not there. I was trying to insert the link to the website and ended up sending the link for the joint link apologies, but the link is the link has been inserted in the chat uh, for the person who asked that question. Um, so, so with that, we are now at time. Oh, Dr. Kaur, did you want to mention something? Oh, no, I just want to say I agree with uh, Dr. Wall that um, at very early stages, there are reports, but the, uh, I think it's more noise than, than actual signal. Um, and I wouldn't read into it too much. I know lots of people want to read into stuff, but I encourage people not to. 
And the first patients we're treating are, are really, really sick in general too. So you're, you're, you know, we're, we're, it's, it's not, it's not an easy story to sort out yet. Right. So, you know, the, the verdict is still out. So with, you know, use your discretion, uh, speak to your providers, try and do as much of culling of information as you can before arriving at a decision, but, uh, you know, still very early days, but some promising, um, um, but moving in the promising direction. Um, so with that, I mean, I can't thank our panelists, our speakers, our, our presenters enough. It's been a pleasure being able to help moderate you through this discussion. I thank you for taking two out of two hours of your personal Saturdays to spend it with us. Um, to our audience members, thank you for your attentiveness and participation. Um, I'm just going to close and wish you all a beautiful Saturday. I uh, hope you have a great weekend. And once again, the recording of this session will be made available on the sickle cell and eva.com website. So with that, I close today's clinical trial session. And thank you so much for participating. Have a good day, everyone.